Saturday evening, May the 28th, 1983. Memorial Weekend Deliverance and Teaching Seminar being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Wynne Worley is the speaker of the evening. Father, I pray the anointing and the glory and the blessing of the Lord over Brother Worley tonight as he ministers your word and as he reaches out and we put things in underfoot and loose those who are bound captive from those that things that hinder and loose and cause them to not walk as they should before thee. We loose them this evening and to loose the ministry of Brother Worley as he ministers the portion of the word that comes forth from him tonight for your glory. We loose the presence of the mighty power of the living God to flow and move here, the angels of the Lord to minister with us as we bind up the powers of Satan and put the demons underfoot. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before I begin tonight, let me urge you to pick up the Chick comic books if you don't have them. The Force, The Godfathers, Alberto, and Double Cross. Be sure you have those. They're difficult to get because the Catholic forces have put on so much pressure to ban Jack Chick's books, all of them now, because of the exposure of the Roman Catholic system. And uh, I would encourage you to get these books, study them closely, and know that they're based on historical fact and not Catholic fiction. You have to realize that the Catholic Church has managed to stifle all criticism for about the last 30 years. When I was growing up as a young man, coming up around Bible preaching churches in the South, every Bible preaching church that claimed any relationship to the Bible was attacking the Roman Catholic system as the harlot church, without exception. And then there came a time of great ecumenical glory, and the charismatic sweep was the opportunity the the Catholics had waited for and they joined eagerly in it. When you can't stop something, you join it, infiltrate it, and try to take it over. And that's exactly what's happened. That doesn't mean that the charismatics are all bad. But many non-charismatics have a bad taste in their mouth because of the Catholic infiltration. Chick's books will give you some documentation on what has happened, what is happening. Also pick up Ralph Woodrow's. Uh, the Babylon Mystery Religion. They have all of these at the book table. I would encourage you to do without something else and take these home with you if you have to. You need these books to study and find out what is true because, believe me, the truth has been suppressed for a long, long time. If you don't think the truth has been suppressed, you try. When Jack Chick released Alberto, a 69-cent comic book, the Vatican shook worldwide. Can you imagine anything as big as the Roman Catholic institution? I don't like to call it a church. I associate the church with what the Bible is talking about. And the Roman Catholic institution is just that. It's an institution. It's a hierarchy. It's a monstrosity. Can you imagine a 69-cent comic book shaking the Vatican, which controls millions and billions of dollars and multiplied millions of people in an ironclad grip? a 69-cent comic book. If they had ignored it, most people would have never heard of it. But instead, in Europe, they immediately moved where they had control and banned it. And this called attention to it. They moved, and they moved in on the bookstores here, the Christian bookstores, and they have blackmailed every Christian bookstore not to handle any of Jack Chick's material. They've tried their best to put him out out of business. He followed Alberto with Double Cross, then the Godfathers, and now the worst one of all, the Force. And, of course, the other one is, what's the name of that blue book? Um, can't think. Smoke Screens. Yes, you need to get that one, too. It has some lovely pictures in it, where they're sawing off a man's head with a cross-cut saw, some Catholics, uh, sawing off somebody else's head. This happened during World War II, chopping them off with an axe, all these neat little things that somehow didn't get reported to you. The Roman Catholic institution is one of the biggest monstrosities that the world has ever spawned. It's the worst thing that's ever been spawned out of the mouth of hell. And it's a part of the conspiracy that is dragging everything down. It's it's a big part of the New Age movement. Oh, is it ever. By the way, get the New Age book, too, uh, Coming Holocaust by Dave Hunt. Constance Cumbie book is not out yet. Pray for Cumbie, by the way. She doesn't even understand how dangerous the Roman Catholics are. She's been in our church. We loaded her with material before she left. But uh, she has a 
She doesn't know. She doesn't see the integration. It's amazing to me how Walter Martin, Constance Cumbie, and others who research can miss the role of the Roman Catholic monster in all this. For she stands out like a sore thumb as the leader of the horrors perpetuated on those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I usually get angry when I preach this message because I hate anything that comes against God's people and this is one of the worst of all. Turn with me please to Revelation chapter 2. By the way, don't call this Revelation. If you look at your book, it says Revelation. I know it's being persnickety, but it's one Revelation. You know what the Revelation is in here? It's the Revelation. And the Revelation is not of St. John the Divine. It is the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything in this book points him up and glorifies him and lifts him. And when I give out the uh, title, I like to say, Turn to the Revelation. And let's take a look at our wonderful Lord, because that's what you're going to look at when you look at, look at the Revelation. The Revelation. One Revelation, many, many truths are in here. And by the way, I don't pretend to know all that, everything that is meant in here, but I'll tell you one thing, there's a lot of profit in here for the believers. Just read and reread it. There's a blessing pronounced on that. Um, I told you to turn to third chapter, I believe. Turn to second chapter of Revelation. Verse 18, The angel of the church of fire tire write these things, saith the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. If you're familiar to the, with the letters to the churches, you know that in every letter, Jesus appeared to the churches in a different way. He appears to them in the way they need help. If they have error, he appears to them in the, uh, his characteristics that are presented are the ones that church needs. Now look at the one in Thyatira. He comes as the Son of God. That's because this church is the age of the church that lost sight of him as the living Son of God and began to worship and serve Mary and pray to the saints. And so he presents himself as the Son of God. And notice his eyes are like a flame of fire. He's coming in judgment. His feet are like fine brass, which speaks of judgment. His eyes are like fire. They see through all the sham, the religious hypocrisy. Last night we were praying with someone and we came up with a spirit of liturgy. And that thing screamed bloody murder. Said, we've got all the churches. We're in all the churches. I said, all of them. He said, most of them. You better go back and take a look. You go to one where they have these lovely altars, you know, the divided chancel. You know what that is? And the steeple, which is the phallic symbol, the symbol of the worship of Baal Peor. I'll just be plain about it. Worship of the male organ of gender of sex. That's exactly what your steeple came from. We've had a lot of junk foisted off on us, folks. You got these lovely uh, split chancel. That means the two pulpits instead of one. That means the Bible's out of the center and you're supposed to gaze at this worship center, the beautiful brass candles and candlesticks and the lovely cross. And that's supposed to sweep you up. <laughs> that's my condensed opinion. <laughs> Jesus said, you'll worship me in spirit and in truth. I like this place. The only thing he's got on the walls is scripture. I like our place better. It's covered with scripture. Glenn, you've got to get going. Our walls are completely covered, four walls, with scripture at Hagrid. The demons complain incessantly. They don't like our wallpaper. Everywhere they look, they get hit. Bang, bang. At Hagrid, you get bored with the sermon, you can sit and read the walls. We've had people get saved reading the walls. Praise the Lord. You can't escape when the word's coming at you. I'm all over. The Word of God is our stay. It's the thing we need. It's the thing we must have. And all of this fancy chandeliers and all these lovely gorgeous stained windows. I don't know why Paul didn't raise money to put in memorial windows. Mm -hmm. Pipe organs. My, my, my. Some people are going to answer to the Lord for the hundreds and thousands of dollars that have been poured down the drain to glorify some person when people needed to go to the mission fields. He comes with his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet are brass, which speaks of judgment. He's coming to trample out judgment on this particular church. Now he goes ahead and he says, I know your works, your charity, love, service, and so forth. 
Now, verse 20, he said, I have a few things against you because you suffer that woman Jezebel. Now, Jezebel, of course, is the fighting words throughout the Bible. You raise up Jezebel, she is the epitome of what a woman should not be. She and Delilah run a long race to be the worst in the Bible, I suppose. Of course, after Delilah, her daughter wasn't in his uh, slouch in that race either. But Jezebel, the wicked, ungodly princess who married and became a queen and who wrecked the whole nation with her harlotry and her vicious worship of Baal. And he said, You suffer this woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now you can take that physically or spiritually. It was both going on. Spiritual adultery is to come and worship other gods. Spiritual adultery is to interweave the occult with the truth. And that's exactly what's happening today in the New Age movement. They're weaving the occult in among, if they could, the churches. And they've already got a bunch of them. Why would a group of people supposedly representing fellowships of Christian churches have to debate whether a homosexual should be ordained to be a minister? Why would they even have to discuss it? Some things are not even open for discussion. The Bible settled it. But when you leave off the Bible and you go off into the occult and into supernatural garbage, then you can raise the bars for almost any garbage, any filth, any uncleanness to come in. And this is exactly what happened in this place. It can happen, it is happening, and it has happened. And we need to rise up and attack, attack, attack. There is no way to come to grips with this thing except to attack. Now, you're not going to tear it down with your money. You haven't got enough. You're not going to tear it down with great numbers of people. There are not that many in the army of God. The, the only way it can be attacked is in the supernatural realm. And binding evil spirits and loosing the spirits of God has already wrecked havoc in the plans of the enemy, has already thrown them back in disarray, and they're complaining already they're running ten years behind. Demons have said this coast to coast. We're running ten years behind in our program already. This stupid country should be in the midst of a world war to destroy it. Everything is messed up. Well, we need some more workers in there to help mess it up. You don't need a bunch of sissies, old dead fish that float downstream and go any way the wind blows. You've got to have live fish that swim upstream against the current. I'll tell you one thing, you're going to have to come out of your denominational hiding places. They won't have you there. The Baptists don't want you. The Assemblies don't want you. None of them will want you. You're going to find out exactly how that man felt. You remember the man who was blind from birth? Huh? Amen. You remember him? And he, he went out looking, and they even cornered his parents and said, Did this happen? They said, Don't ask us. Don't ask us. We don't get thrown out of church. Go talk to him. He's a big boy. And they went and talked to him and said, did this happen? He said, would you like to be his disciples too? They said, ah, ah, blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Oh, they were so wounded. And they put him out of the synagogue. And he said, I don't know why everybody's so upset. I thought it was great. Jesus walked up and said, hello, I'm here. I'm the one you're looking for. I heard the story told a long time ago, and I don't know whether this is so or not. It happened in a Baptist church. Most things that happen in Baptist church are true. <laughs> but I heard about a fellow who was sort of a derelict, and he got saved down the street meeting the Salvation Army somebody had going on. He got saved, and of course he wasn't dressed right, and he didn't look right, and, but he was just all excited about being born again, and he was so excited, and he walked down the street, and here was a big church, the First Baptist Church. The people were going in for service. He thought, good, this is a church. I want to go to church. He never wanted to go to church before. And he went in, and, and the guys caught him at the back. And they said, beg your pardon, what would you want? He said, I'm coming to church. I got born again. They said, oh, well, you, you, you come to the wrong place. This is not the place for you. Why don't you go down on across the track somewhere? There were Pentecostals down there jumping around. They, they might let you in. Uh, you're just not dressed proper. I'm sorry. You'd mess up our service. The story goes he went back out on the porch, you know, and he went down the steps, and 
he sat on the curb and he just started crying. He said, Lord, I don't understand. I just wanted to go to church and worship you and everything. And Jesus walked up. And he said, Lord, they wouldn't let me in. He said, don't feel bad. They haven't let me in in years. I've been trying to get in there myself. That's what's happened in the institutional churches in many places. They don't want it. He doesn't fit their program. Don't wait for the great denominations to join the move of God because they won't. They never have. You can call them by any name you want to. The denominational servants are certainly cranking out programs to glorify our great work, to exalt our magnificent tradition. But when it comes to magnifying Jesus, you're going to find a lot of people dragging their feet. You say, oh, well, we're not like that. Our bunch, you know, we speak in tongues. Oh, yes. That won't fix it either. You think they like it because you speak in tongues? You tell them about getting delivered. They'll show you the door. Out, out. And they don't mean Jesus' name either. Out. Just get out. Out in the name of Springfield. Out in the name of Nashville. Out, out, out. We can't have such things as this. You just might as well make up your mind that you're going to be in a minority. Now, don't get all puffed up about that. It's not the greatest bit of fun in the world at times. I mean, when everybody spits when you pass, it's not necessarily a cage, and you have to really remind yourself. The Lord said, run, leap. You feel like running and leaping to get away from the spit, but he said to run and leap because you've been persecuted for my sake. And by the way, don't go out from this place saying, well, I'm going to go out and pull a fool's son or two, and that will prove that I'm different. Well, if you're like that, you've already proven you're different. And most people that know you know you're different, and it doesn't glorify the Lord. Just because you go out and pull a fool's stunt, that's not suffering for Jesus. I know some people walk in and told their boss, said, God told me not to work anymore, and I'm quitting. I'm living by faith. Then they tried to mooch and panhandle off everybody. By the way, if anybody like that here at camp, don't give them a dime. The Bible says the one who wouldn't work shouldn't eat. You can eliminate the unemployment problem. You can eliminate the mooching problem in about a month and a half. They'll all be either working or dead. I have no patience with these super holy people whom God told me not to work. Well, that's fine. I think that's great. I'll tell everybody, don't give them a dime. Lord, I don't want to interfere with anybody's dedication. I don't. I mean, it says if you if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So by all means, don't interfere. Don't you tempt them to leave the path of glory. In about a month, we'll preach their funeral and tell everybody what great and glorious dedication they had. That right up to the very end, they passed out tracks, but they refused to eat. Because they didn't want to disobey God's word. Which said, if you don't work, you don't eat. I did that to a boy one time. He came in and informed me that God told him not to work. He's able-bodied. There wasn't anything wrong with him. Except laziness. And, uh, and he had an exalted opinion himself. He had to go out and witness everybody. Of course, his idea of faith was to live off everybody else that was working. Thank you, but no thank you. We're not having any of those either. And by the way, if you think Lake Hamilton's a place like that, Irma's the worst taskmaster in the country, and, and right under her comes Glenn. If you get out of the building, Glenn will get you out on the ground. And there's no escape ever. And Jim will come get you if you, if he get, you get away from Glenn. If you're not planning to work, don't plan to hang your hat around here. This place is full of work. <laughs> I've heard that several say they were heading for Lake Calvin. I said, bless these on you. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Listen, you can't be a hippie Christian. Some of us are hippie, but we didn't plan it that way. But a hippie Christian means I let somebody else work and support me, and I lay around and be lazy. Baloney. You find a niche and get to work. Make something useful out of yourself. Well, I don't feel like working. You will when you get hungry enough. Hmm? Oh, yeah. You don't mind mooching telling your sad story. Baloney! You're a shame and a disgrace. If you're going to go out and panhandle, for goodness sakes, don't tell people you're a Christian. 
Don't try to blame God for your stupidity, your utter foolishness, your ignorance. Other people are not as dumb as you are. They see right through you. And especially don't come around to the deliverance place because they got the antennas up already. They saw you when you first walked in view. They're ding, ding, one, doing, 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 doing. Another ding dong just walked in. Now, I'd like to spend time on that, but I guess I better move on. Jezebel called herself a prophetess, and she used so-called spiritual gifts to seduce and drag away the people of God to commit spiritual adultery. And when you get off morally, you will soon be off doctrinally. When you get off badly doctrinally, it won't be long until you'll be off morally. They go together. You show me somebody who's trotting around and sleeping, sleeping around and getting up and preaching like an angel. I'll show you somebody that's going to be off in left field doctrinally. He'll be so far off and he'll be under a spirit of deception. He won't know his right hand from his left. You show me somebody that goes way off in left field and gets away from what God says and gets his own private interpretation of everything, and he's, he's building a little kingdom for himself over here. Boy, I'm great. Hallelujah. How great I am is my theme song. Here I go again. And I'll show you somebody that will soon be off morally. They go together. One opens the gate for the other. Now, it goes together. They eat things sacrificed to idols. He said, I gave her space to repent, and she repented not. I'll cast her in a bed them that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I'll kill her children with death. Thank God. All her young ones are slated for death. Every one of them. Because they're products of adulterous relationships, whether they be spiritual or physical. Now, let's go to the 17th chapter of Revelation. I'm not going to go into all the ramifications of this. First place, I don't know all the ramifications. But I want to point out some salient facts to you that will identify some things. Back in the Revelation 2 chapter, you find the beginning, the first notation of this in the Revelation, of this Jezebel, this terrible female thing. The reason for the female was because they switched from the emphasis on the Son of God over to the feminine. Did you know that the New Age movement has switched over and is ramrodding the ERA? ISIS uh, re-examined is one of their great books. Uh, it came out of the turn of the century. Some woman who was nothing more than a common harlot wrote the book. She was an advocate of free love in a day when nobody did advocated that openly. But she did. And her book is one of their revered, treasured writings. And all of it is demonic. Everything is being directed straight from the demonic minds. And they're leading into... The exaltation of woman to the place where she dominates and controls everything. Why would they want to do that? Simply because it's a perversion of God's truth. Woman was put under special protection of male authority because God had a special love for her. And because she had a tendency to be deceived in spiritual matters, he threw male authority and protection over her so that she would be protected from that. So what has the devil done tirelessly? Tried to persuade her to move out from under that and to get out on her own. Somebody in this family has got to be spiritual. You can sit at home if you want to. I'm going down, taking the young'uns. We're going to church. And that will produce a disaster every time. She goes down to church. They say, I don't blame you, sister. That's the way to be. I'll tell you, somebody's got to serve God around here. How about somebody obeying God? How about somebody doing what Jesus said? What the Word of God declares. But you see, the rebellion is in full swing. And the New Age movement is pushing it with all their might. ERA is not dead. They're planning to revive it. They're making plans now to make another push to get a constitutional amendment. They're not going to be satisfied, gals, if they have you out there pushing the wheelbars and going in the men's toilets. What a thrill. Really a goal to shoot at. They want you down on the level. That's exactly what they're after, people. The enemy is moving this way. And the demons know that the way to do it is to go as they always did. You'll be like God if you follow along with us. And they found some dupes. It's significant that the main heralds, the people who have written the main books that are directing the Aquarian conspiracy are women. 
who've been under deception, ungodly women, full of demons, spouting out demonic lies. they got their men in there too, such as they are. But I'm telling you, this is a move to put Jezebel on the throne. And they're even changing the Bible, you know. In the beginning, she created. That's already been printed in one of their papers. I have somebody handed me a Spiritual Frontiers um, newsletter, and they had this poem to deity. In the beginning, she created, and so forth. Lovely. Everything was changed to feminine gender. Doesn't that make you feel more important, Gal? What a perversion. Listen, the enemy's out to destroy everything. He says, come up hither. 17th chapter of John, of Revelation, verse 1. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters. The whore is the woman who takes on all commerce. She's sitting on many waters. A little later in the chapter, he'll tell you these many waters of the nations of the earth. She's sitting on the waters. She's got her hooks into every nation. Demon told us here well back, we were dealing with a young man, had no Catholic connections whatsoever, and uh, all of a sudden the Lord spoke to me and said Mariolatry, and I thought, that's not right. He's, not in, he's never been in Catholicism, his family, none of his family, for generations back had ever touched base with the Catholic system, but the Lord just kept saying Mariolatry. So I said, I finally said, okay, Mariolatry, how did you know I was here? I said, well, how did you get there? I was curious myself. <laughs> I said, he's not a Catholic. I know it. None of his blankety-blank ancestors either for a long way back. But he said, Whirly, we're in everybody. said, he's Irish. He said, we're in everybody. Somewhere they've got a Catholic ancestor, and we are there. I said, you're not very strong. He said, no, blankety-blanket. But he said, we're here anyhow. We're waiting. Stupid fool didn't help us any. Had to go get saved. <laughs> it does kind of put a crimp in being a Catholic to get saved. How long has it been since you heard a message on come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord? You're hearing a big lot of messages, you know. Our great ecumenical Lord is drawing his people together unifying the glorious body. Huh? He sold out. A lot of others have sold out. You have the man in the glass cathedral over there, smiling, <laughs> saying, Oh, everybody is great. Everybody is wonderful. I don't have my robe to flop. Um, he said, I don't, I don't, if you want Bible teaching, you'll have to go somewhere else. I don't claim to be a Bible teacher. I didn't know he'd been accused. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing that the crowds are flocking in because it's heresy. It's abomination. And the great whore has her tentacles out and she's going to gather all those under one blanket. The old whore's skirts are wide enough to cover everybody who wants to come home. Hmm? But you don't hear the sermons on come out from among them, be you separate. You say, oh, don't say anything about the Catholics. The lovely little nuns are praising Jesus. Well, if they praise him long enough, they'll come out of that mess. If they get in the Word, the priests will come out. They'll stop teaching idolatry. That's what they're teaching. When they lift that cup of abominations that's mentioned here, that golden cup of abomination, demonic dynamite strikes that cup, friend and goes all through that priest. No wonder they believe they're into something supernatural. They are. They're in high-powered ceremonial witchcraft, which is the highest form of witchcraft. They don't call it that. They call it the mess. I call it the mess. It makes a mess out of everybody that gets involved with it. You say, you hate the Catholics. Do not. We've got a church full of X ones. They're all Catholics with X in front of their names. You think I'm hard on them, you ought to have one of my workers get after you. I mean, they're just merciless. They don't, they don't, they go after every single bit. They know where the body's buried. They say, I feel cheated. I was kept away from the good things of God for years by all this heresy. Thank God I got saved. Now notice the kings of the earth committed fornication with her. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Remember, her fornication is idolatry idolatry they pray to saints 
Are you aware that the Bible says that the demon gods they pray to, that when they pray to idols, they pray to demons? Do you know what prayer to demons is? Brings a curse on everyone that does it. I will curse you to the third and fourth generation, God says. It's an abomination. Every one of their saints is a demon. Every one. The Mary in the Roman Catholic system is not the Mary of the Bible. She is semi-amorous, the ungodly queen of heaven. They're right. The Roman Catholic system is right in saying, Mary, queen of heaven, and putting that sunburst behind her. Because it is a worship of Lucifer. And any time you see a halo or a sunburst behind their head, that's Lucifer worship, without exception. And when you hear people talking about, I see your aura, Ooh, get away from me. They're into spiritualism. They're into occultism. I've had them come, you know, and they were Christians. Oh, Brother Willie, I saw your aura. I said, oh, Lord. Surely I haven't failed that badly, you know. I don't want to go for these boys. No, they're seeing with occult eyes. When you come out of occultism, dear friend, you're going to have to lay down every single thing you had without exception, and it'll be suspect until it's checked and proven that it's not a counterfeit. We've got a lot of people crossing the line, getting saved, witches and others have been dabbling in all this mess, and they come across and they say, I have a gift of God. And some guy came up to New York. He called me long distance. He came over there. He was a famous psychic and world famous and all this kind of stuff. He wanted help. He said, I have a gift from the Lord. I had it since I was a child. Nobody understood it. And I graduated from the New Orleans Seminary. And then I went off studying parapsychology. And I became a very famous psychic. Traveled all around the world. With the, worked in top secret government projects. Was in the National Enquirer. Blah, blah, blah. On and on and on. And he said, but I think I need deliverance. I said, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. But you know what? When one of my fellow preachers got a hold of him, he found that he had all kinds of little doodads at home. He said, fellow, you've got to break loose and throw all that garbage overboard. You've got to forget the past. It's all sewage. It's all down the tube. He left without getting any deliverance. Oh, it's so hard to let go of the ding-dongs that you've gathered from the world. When you come across the line, you've got to drop everything and check it out and be sure that it's real. Because a lot of people think they have a spirit of discernment. They just have a spirit of suspicion. They suspect everybody they meet of this, that, and the other. Some people come out of the psychic world and they are still tuned into ESP. you got to get rid of that thing. That's not discernment. It's a counterfeit. And when you're involved in the Babylonian system, you are into witchcraft. We've known for years since we got into, we weren't in deliverance very long until we knew that the whole Roman Catholic system was run by black witchcraft. Then I got to where I'd say it openly. People would look at me. Now, Brother Worley, you're not being very loving. It's hard to love a porcupine. I mean, there's no place you can put your hand. You don't get stuck. And when it comes to witchcraft, there's no way to do it except say it's abomination, it's ungodly, it's wicked. Everything about the Roman Catholic system is rotten. There is nothing to save. Martin Luther tried to save it. It wouldn't work. There's nothing to save. Everything in it is a farce and a counterfeit and lifted. The rosary comes from Buddhism. The candles come out of heathenism. Most of their rituals and everything else come directly out of paganism according to official Roman Catholic sources. And we need to realize this and understand we're dealing with a ball-faced contender who would push the body of Christ in the corner and murder, mutilate, torture, and eliminate every true believer on the face of God's earth. Some uh, months ago, I was in a motel room, and I happened to flip on the TV late at night. One of my men was with me, and I said, let's see if we can pick up the late news. We hadn't seen it, and I saw the Blue Army film. Have you ever seen that thing? The Blue Army of Fatima. I sat, I could not believe it for the next hour. There were two priests, two laymen and a woman, and they were glowing with reports of how the army, the blue army of Fatima was growing worldwide. I couldn't believe it. And they flashed pictures on the screen from India. And they had taken the Blessed Virgin over. They were carrying her, as you've seen them in the professional. 
And they were over in Hindu land attracting crowds of 50,000 people. And they said the Holy Mother is being welcomed by these masses and the Blue Army is growing with our Blessed Lady. And they had the films. The professionals were coming along. Here comes these Hindus worshiping and bowing down to the Madonna on the platform. Just like you see it in Latin America. And they say soon India will be converted to the Blessed Virgin. The Blue Army is growing. People, this thing is going on. This is wickedness. This is abomination. This is the great whore. It's the harlot of revelation. It's the one who has always been at war with the saints. Always. Now notice, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The Roman Catholic Church, of all the churches that have ever existed, is the one that is noted in history. Remember, I've got a master's degree in history. I know what I'm talking about. I've read the books that they've taken off the shelves. I read the books before they revised them and changed them and deleted them and softened them somewhat. The Roman Catholic Church is the one church that always makes for the jugular vein of government. She makes no bones about it. She wants to control the government. And she wants to control everything by controlling the government. In Latin America, she had a stranglehold on Latin America for hundreds of years. And Latin America is one of the most poverty-stricken, illiterate places on the face of God's earth today. And it's because of the Roman Catholic Church. There were no schools for the poor and illiterate until the Protestant missionaries managed to break through the Roman Catholic blockade and get missionaries in there. And they established schools and orphanages. And suddenly, the Roman Catholic Church decided they needed to help the poor folks. Up till then, only the rich folks got help. And they held the others in superstition and bondage. And they didn't care. They never have cared for the poor. They never have cared for anything except power. And illiterate people are much easier to manipulate than learned people. So you don't educate those dummies. You educate the smart people that have got the money and you keep control of them and then you have money and they have money and the poor can go right on groveling in the dirt like they always have. The Roman Catholic system has always produced illiteracy, poverty, the nations that have fallen most easily to communism have been those who were completely controlled by Catholicism, like Poland. They passed from the black totalitarianism to the red. And it's six to one and half a dozen of the other. There's no difference. Drunk with the wine of a fornication. She has moved into the high council. They have moved and moved and moved trying to get us to recognize the Vatican. Presidents have tried their best to get an envoy. That traitor FDR sent a representative to the Vatican. What in thunder do we need a representative in the Vatican for? There's black witchcraft practiced in the Vatican. Demons have revealed this. It's also practiced in the secret places of Moscow. And there's another center of spiritualism in Brazil. These are three special cockpits of disaster that the enemy is working in. But the Roman Catholic system travels under the guise of being lovely. And if you want to investigate what's been going on down in Central America, you'll find out that those nuns and so forth that were, were killed, they were spies and revolutionaries. They were not little innocent nuns that went down there to help the children. Don't be taken in by that Catholic garbage. They're trying to fan it into propaganda. Everything is used to help the Catholic Church. The truth has nothing to do with it. They eliminate the people who become problems. In our church, we got sick and tired of all the lies in the newspapers, the radio, the TV, nothing but control news being fed out. Some of our boys, I think Tom stood up one Sunday, he said, I wish you'd join me. I'm going to start binding the lies and deceit in the, in the press and the, the media and loose spirit of truth and revelation to uncover the spiritual uh, religious and political rottenness of the country and expose it. I think it was, what, a month and a half later, the Cardinal Cody thing exploded right on the front pages of the Sun-Times. And believe you me, the Sun-Times is anything but anti-Catholic. They would have never done it, but they didn't have any choice. We can force things to change, people. By supernatural power, we can twist the whore and make her squeal. Poor old Cody got caught in it, you know, and they eliminated him. 
Oh, you surely didn't think he died a natural death. No more than Rockefeller did when he was exposed as the head of all the drug financing in the world. He became an embarrassment and they eliminated him in short order. You don't, you don't stay around these big boys, you know. You ride high, but when you fall, you fall fast and quick and you're blotted out. They're drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness and I saw a woman. Notice again the feminine character of this because the Virgin Mary is still leading the parade, isn't she? Isn't it the Blessed Virgin? The novenas, the month of May, scapulars, all of the garbage. Mary is still the great high priestess. I saw her sit on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. My lands are living. What a monstrosity, huh? He tells us in verse 9, the seven heads of seven mountains on which she sits. Most of you are aware that Rome sits on seven hills. So does Moscow, so does San Francisco, but none of them is a religious center. You couldn't call Moscow a religious center, nor San Francisco. I don't think it would be considered religious either. But uh, at any rate, Rome qualifies. She's sitting on this seven heads, the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. She's sitting ensconced. There are multiplied millions and billions in gold, silver, and precious stones in the vaults of the Vatican. Don't feel bad about her bank going busted. She could, she could have bust like that every day for a year or two and never feel it. I don't feel sorry for her. Not at all. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Have you noticed that when the Pope is, uh, uh, put in office or when you have the uh, funeral of the Pope or when you have a bishop installed like in Chicago you'd think the whole world had come to a stop and every network focuses their color cameras on it as if that's the most interesting thing in the world it's so sick and tired of seeing it everywhere you turn the pomp and splendor of the scarlet harlot is on parade what are the colors that predominate scarlet and purple how strange the woman was arrayed. She was decked out in scarlet and purple. And she was decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Have you taken a closer look at the accoutrements around the Pope, the bishops, the cardinals? You notice the precious stones? You notice this minor, didn't you? Shaped like a fish head. Old Dagon himself, Leviathan. Yep, that's where it comes from. On the mitre is written... 666, Vicar of Christ on earth, the voice of Jesus on earth. When he speaks, ex cathedra, now since you're probably not Latin students, you don't know, that means when he speaks from the throne. When he sits down on his throne and he speaks, it's absolutely binding on every Roman Catholic in the world. On pain of excommunication, severance, from the church, which means going to hell. You can make people dance a merry tune if you've got them convinced you, you hold the key of whether they go to heaven or hell. Did you know that? I got you, I got news for you. There's some people who are not Catholic who have tripped to that. I know some preachers who threaten people with going to hell. Hmm? You better support me! Your children will get sick, you'll die outside of God, and you'll go to hell. It's a lovely way to control a church, and that's going on. Of course, I think anybody would have to be insane to stay in that kind of thing. If you're not insane, you soon will be. Get out and let him dry up. Let him fold up. Let him scream at somebody else. Shepherds are supposed to love and nurture the flocks. They're also supposed to drive off those who create contention and strife. So don't, uh, don't say, well, that's just the way I feel. And I've been persecuted out of my church. Well, you may have deserved it. If you went around causing contention and strife, he's got an obligation to take a stick to you. There's a crook on it to pull you out of the thing. There's a stick on the other end to whop you with it if you need it that way. Some of you are looking funny now. Check it out. It's all in there. I run across a lot of people. You know, they gather and they, they drift into deliverance meetings looking for somebody to sympathize with me. I've been so mistreated. <laughs> I've learned to be careful before I sympathize too much to find out just what happened. Because a lot of times... They deserve, if they, des uh, I, I've talked to some of them, you know, they'd come and pour out their tale of woe. I said, my lands, that preacher must have loved you. I said, I'd have whopped you out a week, week before he did. I'd give you your walking paper. You're supposed to love the flock. I suppose you're supposed to behave yourself. 
You're not supposed to act like an idiot either. You're not supposed to sow discord among the brethren. You're not supposed to go around gossiping and talking, slandering the church. No wonder he got rid of you. Goodbye. I get rid of them. Listen, some people have been nurtured. They, they were born in the objective case and the kickative mood. And they're not going to fit anywhere. Simply because they don't fit in with anybody because nobody's going to do exactly like they want them to do. And they're so full of rebellion that they won't settle down and learn anything. They have a spirit of the brute, which is unteachableness. They can't learn. They already know it. We've had some people in our church, you know, everything you tell them, everything. Oh, I know that. Oh, I've done that. I looked at one boy here a while back and I said, hey, I've told you everything I know. And I know quite a bit. <laughs> I'd really, I'd spend a lot of time with that boy. But every single thing I said, well, have you tried this, son? Yes, I've already done it. It doesn't work. Well, have you tried this? Yes, I've already done that. It doesn't work. Everything he had tried, he said, but he was getting no result. And I said, well, I don't want to be unkind, son, but look, there are dozens of people in our church. They are trying the things that, you're, that I've mentioned to you, and the big majority of them are getting results. Some are getting spectacular results. Some are getting small results. Some are getting middle-sized results. But the big majority are getting some result. And I said, you say you tried and absolutely nothing happened. Now, where do you suppose the problem lies? <clears throat> he didn't like that. But you've got to face the fact sooner or later that there may be something you don't know. You may even have to do it the second time. Oh, Horace, you don't understand. I've spoken it. Well, fine, if it happens. But if it doesn't, you better get to speaking again. I believe in speaking until it's done. I believe in speaking that's done. And if it is, I'll say hallelujah. I'll jump up and down with you. But if it isn't done, I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to go home and sit down and suck my thumb until it happens. I'm going to be on the doctor every day and say, hey, Lord, you know, <clears throat> that matter we talked about yesterday, you know, it's still hanging over here. Unless it doesn't really bother me, then I'm going to neglect it. You said, but that's not faith, not faith, not faith. Oh, come on now. I remember the first time I ran across the spirit of faith only. Dr. Haggard had it cornered. I walked in, I'd been down my uh, hall to my office, I came back in, and a uh, man was lying on, one of my men was lying on the floor just writhing around, <laughs> and I walked up, and Marcus just standing there, you know. I said, what, what is that, Marcus? He said, when, said, do you know anybody named, and he gave me the name of a famous teacher, did you ever hear of so-and-so? And I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, I didn't know. He said, that spirit just came out of him. said, that's what the Holy Spirit told me. And I called it out. I never had heard of it. But it came right out. And I said, well, what's this one now? This on there now? Because it's winding around and snarling and everything. He said, well, he says his name is Faith Only. And as soon as he said that, the Lord spoke in my head. And I said, why, Faith Without Works is dead, Marcus. That thing said, shut up. Shut up, it's faith only, faith only, faith only, faith only, faith only. He's been taught right. Now get away from here, Worley. What you have to come back? And faith only, we sent on a long trip. And he came out of a very famous teacher. If I mentioned his name, you'd all know him. You'd say, who is it? None of your business. I'm not here to blast. I'm just pointing out that these spirits can come in when you receive things that are not true. There is truth in speaking in faith. But if you push it over the cliff, you've got error. There's a ditch on the right-hand side. There's a ditch on the left-hand side. Now, most people don't drive right down the middle of the line like I do. But you ought to be somewhere on the road. huh? Don't swing too far to the right. You'll be in the ditch. Too far to the left, you'll be in the ditch. Of course, if you're like me, you'll drive right in the middle. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that? Don't grin at me like that, Glenn. He knows it's true. Uh, <laughs> Let's go back to our woman here. She's decked out in scarlet and purple with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And I'll tell you, if you ever see one of those statues in parade, you'll see this. You'll see gold. Precious, they don't, listen, they don't put any fakes on those. I mean, Our Lady has to have the very best. If it takes somebody's blood earnings, they've got to have it. And they squeeze the people for every penny. Never full. Now, notice it has a golden cup in her hand, full of abomination. How many of you ever went to a Catholic service? Anybody? All right. You remember that when he's making the magic formula, when he's doing the witchcraft to change the blood, 
change it into blood and change it into the bread into flesh. You remember he comes to a place and he elevates the host and then he picks up the golden cup, doesn't he? It's always gold, isn't it? Isn't that funny that John saw that on the Isle of Patmos before there ever was such an abomination? He saw that cup and he saw her lifting it up. Now when that cup is elevated, when the host is elevated, there's a bolt of demonic lightning that hits that. Alberto Rivera says that you have no idea what power courses through that cup and down into the priest when he lifts that thing up and elevates the host or the cup. No wonder they're convinced they're into something supernatural. They are. Ceremonial witchcraft. The highest form of abomination before the Lord. And she holds this golden cup and notice what it is. It's full of what? Abominations. So what do you take when the wafer, your little wafer God, is dipped into that cup of abominations? What do you get when you get it? And you. You got it. Abominations. And the filthiness of her fornication, because you are worshiping that God. You know why you bow down when you come in the Catholic Church? Because all the wafers that are left over are put in that little gold box up there. And when you come in the church... You bow down because God's sitting in a box up there. Jesus is sitting in there. There are also human bone relics in every Catholic altar. You say, I didn't know that. Well, you ought to dig around. you find out. It's all there. They don't make any secret of it. I compiled the story of Sister Charlotte and escaped from a cloistered convent from her tapes, put it together, and we put a list of the cloistered convents in the back of the book all over the United States, and people have called those convents and they know about the book. And not one of the convicts, not one of the mother superiors has denied what's in the book yet. They just wonder why people are upset about it. It's a nice bedtime story. You may not be able to sleep much after you read it, but you, it, it's a good, good, time to, good bedtime story. These people not only commit these abominations and horrors, but they have no shame about them. They wonder why you're upset. Things that go beyond human imagination. The horror. And when you are involved, you come in and bow down to your way for God. That's why you genuflect every time you turn around. You say, well, what about holy water? Crucifix it. The demons love it. They make a nice Hollywood movie, you know, with the priest coming and dancing with the crucifix in front, you know, like this, you know, and the demon, <laughs> that demon's not afraid of that thing. The only reason he'd put on a show like that if he did was for the people there. You read The Devil and Karen Kingston, you'll find out there was a, a priest there. He came, he was present when ten people were delivering this girl. Unfortunately, the book's out of print now, but tremendous story. And this is a true story, documented. And uh, the priest went out and got a, he decided they needed somebody to exercise. So the second day he shows up with a prayer that he'd copied off of one of the popes several years back. Prayer of exorcism, one of the great popes. So he wrote down the prayer of exorcism, and he advanced on the demon reading this prayer. The demon said, I'm not afraid of that blankety-blank thing. He stared at that thing, and the paper burst into flame, and the guy had to drop it. And the next day he brought back what he thought would really do it. He brought back a crucifix that the pope had blessed when he made a pilgrimage to Rome. And he advanced on that demon holding that crucifix, in Hollywood fashion, coming toward it. And that demon looked and said, I'm not afraid of that blankety-blank thing. And something hit his hand, wham, and knocked it, and that thing fell to the floor. And then that demon stared at that crucifix and started hopping across the floor toward the demon. And the figure on the cross did like this. And then the thing burst into flame right in front of ten witnesses. Now do you think they're afraid of that? Thank God there was a man and his wife who knew something about the name of Jesus. They popped it to him. They got that kid free. But everybody else didn't know nothing. The psychiatrists, the medical doctors, the nurses, the priests. That was Southern Baptist priest. He didn't know nothing neither. But there was a little Pentecostal preacher and his wife, and they did know what they were doing, and they hopped on that thing. In three days, they wrestled it out. Thank God. What I just want you to see is a lot of these trappings are strictly that. They're trappings. They don't mean a thing. Don't Don't try to write crosses on somebody's head in oil and think that's going to scare the demon. I hate that kind of stuff. What are you trying to be, Catholic or something? If you need oil, just lay it on there. Don't be drawing crosses. The demons are not impressed with drawing crosses, I'll assure you. 
They'll spit in your face just as readily over that as they would in the others. A hand, a golden cup in hand full of abomination. On her forehead is written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abomination of the Earth. And the Roman Catholic system goes directly back to Babylon. The Masonic Lodge and the Eastern Star go directly back to Babylon. All of the lodges that I know anything about go directly back to Babylon. And those are the things that God has cursed from the earth. And if you're involved in any of those things, you need to cut loose from them, renounce them, and run quickly to Jesus and get loose from all this garbage. Because the hour is coming and now is when men are going to have to give an accounting for all this stuff. Now notice this woman's drunk with the blood of the saints. Nobody, nobody has murdered more believers, born-again believers, than the Roman Catholic system. I mean, she is a killing machine. She's a bloodthirsty machine. Just like it says here, she is drunk with the blood of saints. She's drunk so much blood till she just staggers. And still she can't have enough of her fill of killing the saints. Everywhere that the Roman Catholic Church has the power, she'll pass laws against everybody else. She'll put them out of business. She will kill and torture anybody who opposes her. Under Roman Catholic dogma, only truth has a right to exist. And guess who has the truth? You and I are era. If you can't twist us into the system, blot them out. Now, that, that is logic according to the Roman Catholic system. They believe that only truth has a right to exist, and everybody except them is in error. Now, they're willing to give you a little time and space to repent and join the great movement. But if you don't, believe me, as soon as they have power, they will kill you. They'll kill your children. There is no mercy in the harlot. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. Millions of Christians have been killed in the world's history. Many of them by pagans and barbarians. But the Catholic Church has killed far more than any barbarian empire ever dreamed of killing. She has dreamed up more horrible things, more horrible ways to put people to death than has ever been in the world history. She is the arch murderer of murderers. She's the blasphemer. She's the one who exalts Mary and the saints between people and Jesus Christ so they cannot get to Him. She teaches people to abase themselves and fall before dumb idols that cannot speak than behind which are demon spirits which infest the people and press them further from hope. She's the one who concocted the lie of purgatory. She's the one who got, gets them going round and round the beads trying to get help. She's the one who has done all of these terrible things, both in her churches and in every nation that she leeches onto. She sucks them dry. She's drunk with the blood of saints. She has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I get so sick and tired of these people saying, Oh, but you know they build hospitals and they build orphanages. Well, they need to build orphanages. Because all their priests are called father and they're single. But they're called father for a good reason. They need the orphanages to take care of what's going on. It's an abomination. It's vile. It's wicked. It's ungodly. They need hospitals because they make more people sick than anybody I know. There's more demonic infirmity spirits than, I, than we've ever dreamed possible infecting people who have come out of the Roman Catholic system. That system teaches suffering as a virtue. Their saints are martyrs, masochists, loving to suffer for humanity. It's a perversion. It's a wicked, demonic perversion. And the people coming out of that system have all kinds of hangovers in that. Just for an example, there's a saint called St. Catherine. One of the ladies in our church happens to be named Catherine. That was one of her names. By the way, when you get confirmed in the Catholic Church, every name they name you after a saint, you get a demon spirit by that name in you. When the priest, in preparation for baptizing that baby, anoints it with oil, he puts a demon in it. When he puts salt on his tongue, he puts a demon in it. When he puts holy water on it, he puts another one in it. And that's the way it is. All the way through every sacrament loads you with demonic spirits. 
because they have nothing else to deal in, people. They have no blessings to give. Their blessings are cursed. There is no way the Roman Catholic Church can bless anything. I don't know how many people I found with throat trouble because their throats had been blessed with candles on St. Blaise Day or something. Ask any Catholics, they'll tell you. But St. Catherine, this, this lady, uh, somebody stood up and said they'd researched about St. Catherine. She was a martyr in history. Whether it's a fable or not, you can't tell because the Catholics make up everything they want to go along with their stories. But anyway, she was supposed to have been a martyr for the faith, and, and they, they pulled, they tortured her, they put her on the wheel, they rolled her through the street, and they tore her apart, finally. And this lady in our church that was named Catherine, she said, oh my Lord, said, no wonder, every time I went into deliverance, I felt like I was being torn apart. I felt like I was being, every part of my body was being tortured and pulled and twisted. They went after the spirits of St. Catherine. That had come into that child since when she was a little girl being confirmed. Her parents, not knowing any better, had put that mess on her. Dedication to be a nun. Dedication to be a priest. It's a curse. And people who are cursed with it carry that curse. It destroys marriages. We were, I was dealing one time with a lady and her husband, and she was in deliverance, and Mariolatry manifested. The worship of Mary, one of the nastiest spirits you'll ever get hold of. He turned and looked at me and he said, I hate you, but I hate him worse. Said he ruined her. She was never supposed to be married. She was dedicated to me. He, they'd gotten married and had a child. In the demon's eyes, she was ruined. But he said, we're going to kill this brat she's carrying. We're going to kill it. But he didn't. <laughs> But he would have. They're vicious. And the parents put those things on the children without even knowing it. What are they doing? The blind are leading the blind. Both are going in the ditch. The scarlet harlot has no redeeming virtues. She is a total wipeout. She's an abomination of abominations of the earth. She's the mother of harlots. Other systems have sprung out of her and her filth and her abomination. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs, of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. What he means is, I was filled with awe. I was awestruck. I could not believe the horror of what I was seeing. Didn't mean he admired her in the sense, oh, what a wonderful gal. It was just, ah! It's hard to believe. And then the angel said, why did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries it. has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind that has wisdom, the seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, one, the other is yet to come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, he goes on talking about... Uh, the ten horns, or ten kings, verse 12. And uh, verse 13, they have one mind and will give their power and strength to the beast. I would strongly advise you to read that New Age book over there and get the, uh, find out what's happening. You would be surprised how many intellectuals, brilliant people in the world's mind, have already begun to focus together and think alike, moving toward the one world system. And they will give one mind, one mind, and one, and they're going to give their power and strength to the beast. The Antichrist shall rise on the wings of the surrender of the world rulers. They will surrender. When I was taking graduate courses in college in Illinois, I heard PhD after PhD stand and lecture. I could not believe what they were saying. They were great admirers of Marx and Engels and the communist dream. They openly admired the system. They said it's really great what they have done in Russia. Our system is falling apart. Everything has been tried. Nothing has worked. Nationalism has failed. Uh, democracy has failed. Republics have failed. Uh, Karl Marx had a good idea. Then they went on to say this. What the world really needs is for one man to come on the scene of the world 
who will be able to take charge of the United Nations and work out a solution for all our problems. They talked about the Superman. I sat there and I thought, my, 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 you're doing it already. You're setting the stage. You're getting ready for what's coming. Friend, this was 15, 20 years ago. They're a lot further down the track now. These are PhDs. These are people who studied in Europe. These are people who are in touch with the intelligentsia. The intelligentsia is already sold out. Long ago, they sold out. And they're moving in droves. And they're the ones who are the advisors to the president. They're the ones who move into positions of government. Have you ever noticed how many foreign names and foreign-born people there are in positions of authority in our government? Whatever happened to our homegrown people? We got to import them from Russia or Germany or somebody? Real strange, huh? Strange we have no more people. It's not an accident, people. It's all been planned. As Franklin Roosevelt said long ago, if it happens, we planned it that way. And yet the believers slumber on, the scarlet harlot moving in the religious scene, swamping and taking over everything, infiltrating the charismatics and paralyzing them with the venom that says, don't criticize your Catholic brothers. I will, so long as they worship their way for God and teach idolatry, I'll stand and say, no! I don't care how much you pray in tongues. I don't care how you shout and glorify. I am offended by your idolatry. I will not accept it. I will not join hands with you. No. A thousand times no. You remember in Acts, when they uh, talked about to the Gentile churches, they told them to abstain from immorality, to abstain from idols, and from things strangled, from blood. Three things they told them were essential. Keep yourself free from idols. That's the Catholic Church. Keep yourself free from fornication. That's immorality. And keep yourself free from eating blood. That's always been forbidden. And it's an integral part of Satan worship, of witchcraft, and it will soon, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it won't be long until we'll have blood pudding and blood sausages offered on supermarket shelves and in the freezers as a delicious, nutritious substitute and snack. It wouldn't surprise me at all. They've done everything else God said don't do. They're advertising immorality and saying it's great, live in. Three's company. Hmm? Everybody has to have a live in friend, don't they? Isn't that what TV is teaching? All the soaps, you know. I read somewhere one of the women on General Hospital, uh, they were running a list of how many affairs she had had in the course of the last ten years. She had slept with everybody on the show practically. I'm just talking plain. Well, we might as well get it out in the open. It's, it's in the open. And this kind of rottenness is going all over, and that's bad enough. But what really gets to me is when the preachers stalk around and say, well, you know, God told me <coughs> to get rid of this wife I've got. <coughs> I know it says in the Bible, stay with the wife of your youth, but God told me different. Well, he got off track, friend. When you start getting revelations like that, you have bombed out. Then these same men turn around, they want to be pastors of churches and elders. My Bible says no a thousand times no. It does not say they can't serve God. It doesn't say they can't repent. Can't, it doesn't say they can't be used of God. It does say they cannot be a pastor, they cannot be an elder, and I don't care how many preachers are in that position today, it's still wrong and God won't bless it. And I can give you a very good reason why it won't work. Just a simple practical thing. I don't know whether this has anything to do with this or not, but anyhow I'm going to say it. That man who has put away his wife and taken on another one, can never take a strong stand for marriage. If a couple comes to him, says, we're going to get a divorce. They say, he says, no, no, no. You mustn't do that because that's forbidden by Scripture. They'll say, why not? You did. What's he going to say? He's going to, have to hang his head and just back off. And that's what they do. My Bible doesn't talk like that. My God talks about putting marriages together not taking them apart. And I know there's a rash of this mess going around. Uh, well, it's all right, you know, but it didn't all right. When you go into those things, God automatically puts you in a different category. Doesn't mean you can't do anything for God, but I'll tell you one thing, 
there's some positions you'll never hold. Not scripturally, you won't. And if you defy them and go over the fence and do it like some are doing, you're going to have endless trouble like they're having. I don't know where that rabbit came from, but I thought I'd shoot him while he's running. All right. They have one mind. They'll give their power and strength to the beast, and they'll make war with the Lamb. But look at this. The Lamb will overcome them. Praise the Lord. All the combined power of this hellish force is not able. The political religious power will come and make war on the on the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome it. Why does he do this? Because he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called, faith, uh, chosen, and faithful. They that are with him. Who's going to enjoy this victory? Well, you can. You're called, chosen, faithful. Oh, did I weed some of you out there? Maybe you better reconsider, huh? Reminds me, you know, that there's a scripture, you know, that says many are cold and uh, many are called and few are chosen. A little girl heard the sermon on that one day. She went home. Her mother said, honey, what the preacher preach about? Said, well, he preached on that scripture over there where it said, many are cold and a few are frozen. <laughs> and that's unfortunate, the status in most places. But he says that the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Lamb himself, shall make war with this conglomerate and shall defeat them. And they that are with him are called. They're chosen. They're faithful. And he said, the waters on which you saw... The whore was sitting are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Listen, this whore was not a small operation. She had everything. She had infiltrated and controlled everything. As you read the fourth, you'll be astonished at some of the things in it if you're not aware of them. As you read the Battle of Mr. Religion and these others, it will clue you in on the religious aspect of what's happening. There's also an economic and a political move. They're all integrated. They're all moving. And some of them are independent. They don't even know which way they're going. But they're all meshing together. And they're moving toward a climactic union in which they shall edge up and throw all their power to lift the Antichrist. Now let me say one thing about the Antichrist. It doesn't mean what you think. The word anti does not mean against. It means instead now back up and listen to that again. They are moving to put the instead Christ on the throne. One who will stand up and look like the Savior. Peace. Peace. What are people wanting in the world today? If somebody emerges from the world scene with a plan that looks like it will give peace, will they follow him? Adolf Hitler, energized by demonic energy, stood up and screamed at multitudes, thousands of young people, and challenged them to follow him to death. He said, if you follow me, you will die. You will die for the fatherland. But Germany will rule the world. And they stood and shouted themselves hoarse, Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! By the way, those recorded speeches are now on tape and they're a runaway bestseller. You cannot even get a copy of Mein Kampf, which is a demonic bunch of demonic blitherings, and yet they can't run them off the presses far enough, fast enough. The demand exceeds the supply. There's a demonic move on like you wouldn't believe. You better get in tune with what's going on in the heavenly. The devil is moving to put the instead Christ up on the pedestal of the world. And the world will fall down and worship him in dealing with witchcraft up in Canada. We ran onto the trail of a girl who was being used in satanic experiment. And they, these Satan worshippers were in San Francisco were experimenting with what it would take to cause people to fall down and worship a person. And she was being used as the object of worship in these various rituals. They were testing them to see what would cause the maximum reaction. Doesn't that kind of send a cold chill to you? The devil's already checking things out, getting ready, because he's getting ready for that day when he'll call like Nebuchadnezzar of old. When you hear the sound of the music, everybody fall on your face and worship the image. It's coming. How soon? I don't know. 
I think we can push it back ways. I think that'd be great, don't you? If nothing else, because it'd aggravate the devil. I mean, wouldn't that aggravate the devil out there? You know, he's got everything going. Oh, everything gung ho, gung ho. We got it all set. The old harlot's moving. The new age movement's moving. Everything's moving. Economic, political, everything is moving to make a mess. And then here comes a bunch of little peanuts, handfuls of dirt. Hallelujah. We bind you in Jesus' name. We loose the spirits of God. We bind you. We loose. We bind. We loose. Consternation in the ranks of Satan. Where did that bunch come from? How did they get loose? I ordered everything bound. But there are some who can't be bound. There are some who refuse to be bound. There's some, he said, I told you to threaten them with death. They said, we did. It didn't work. Idiot said, good. We'll go home to be with Jesus. He said, I told you to buy them off. We tried. They just weren't for sale. The last one tried to buy me off. I said, I don't even have the title papers. Can't even sell an old car without the title papers. I said, go see Jesus. He holds the papers. I gave them to him a long time ago. If you want to buy me, you have to get to see him. He'll sell me. Go ahead. He just cussed me out. I don't think he ever checked. you got to get over being afraid of the devil, friend. Oh, he's got power, but it's coming. It's coming. We're going to see the power of our God. I'm ready to see Jesus unveil his mighty arm, aren't you? I'd, li <laughs> I'd like to see him just pace the devil, a real good one. Or we can all see it, don't you? Now, I know that when you get in deliverance, you glorify Satan and you glorify demons. I know this because I've heard it over and over and over and over again. If you tell a lie often enough, it becomes true, doesn't it? Not really. If you were here last night, you got a good demonstration of the devil being glorified. Leave me alone! Stop! Stop! Don't make me go! <laughs> That's glorifying the devil. You mean the devil gets mileage out of that? You've got to be out of your head. When the devil is in full retreat, I leave! I leave! All right, I leave! Leave me alone! <laughs> oh, and there's some more going to run tonight. Some of them are already twisting inside. They're going, that whirly's on that one string fiddle again. Just plays one tune. Come out, come out, wherever you are. We're going to have a coming out party. Amen? Praise the Lord. It's like debutantes, you know. Oh, listen. We're going to call the Babylonian spirits. I, mean, I think that would be good. Don't you think that would be nice? They didn't know I was going to do this, so we'll just swap them with that. <laughs> yes, I got my list here. I think I got most of them here. In the name of Jesus Christ, I break every curse of Babylon over the people tonight. I confess in Jesus' name the sins of Babylon that the fathers and the ancestors of these people have committed. In the name of Jesus Christ, I confess the sins of idolatry, the sins of witchcraft, the sins of unbelief, the sins of lust, the sins of God robbing, the sins of abominations and abominable behavior, and we receive forgiveness for the sins of the ancestors of these people. In the name of Jesus, because 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess those sins, that you'll cleanse and you'll forgive. And we claim this for every living soul here tonight. And because of this, Father, in Jesus' name, I take authority. I lift the curses, the whoredoms, and the iniquities off of the people and off of their descendants right now in Jesus' name. And by the name of Jesus Christ, we attack you. We come against the spirits of Babylon tonight, Roman Catholicism, spirits of idolatry, spirits of the mass, Spirits of Catholic baptism. Come out of there now. Come on. Prayer to the saints. Come on. Prayer to demon saints. Come out now. Move. Come on. Breathe them out, people. Let them go. Come out of there now in Jesus' name. Just breathe them out. They'll come out. Dedication to the priesthood. Dedication to be a nun. Come out now in Jesus' name. Spirits from the mass. One holy priesthood. One true church. Holy Eucharist. Adoration of the host. Come out now in Jesus' name. Holy Eucharist, adoration of the host, incense, the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the joyful mysteries of the rosary, immaculate conception of Mary, come out in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the glorious mysteries of the rosary, the authority of the Pope, we cut all the soul ties between the Pope and the people, between the nuns and the priests and the people, we cut those soul ties. We come against infallibility of the Pope, fear of the priests, fear of the nuns, confessional 
the confessional. Come out of there. That came from the Babylonian system. Come out of there in Jesus' name. Holy water. Sacred heart of Jesus. Holy family. Stations of the cross. Blessing of the throat. Saint Blaise. Come out of there in Jesus' name. Saint Joseph. Saint Mary. Saint Anne. Saint Elizabeth. Saint Catherine. Saint Jude. Saint Christopher. All the saints. Come out. Come out in Jesus' name. Come on, all the confirmation names that were named after demons. Come out of there in Jesus' name. Let them go, people. Loose them and let them go. Purgatory. Fear of purgatory. Fear of hell. Hatred. Guilt. Condemnation. Unworthiness. Good work. Mind control. Liturgy. Holy orders. Extreme unction. Confirmation. Spirits from the sacraments. Benediction. Human bone relics in the altars. Genuflection, bowing down to idols, candles, worshiping the saints, praying before the saints, feast days of the saints, votive candles, witchcraft control, forced celibacy, poverty, religious metals, sacrifice of the mass, angel of good counsel, sign of the cross, spiritual adultery, indulgences, infant of pride. Come out of the people. Breathe them out hard, people. Let them go. Come on. All those that are in there by inheritance, come out in Jesus' name. Move in Jesus' name. All those spirits of Catholic that came in from inheritance, come out. Come out in Jesus' name. Come out in Jesus' name. Worship and veneration of Mary. Mariality. Mariology. May altars in honor of Mary. Immaculate conception of Mary. Sacred heart of Mary. Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Lady of Mercedes. Our Lady of Fatima. Mary, Queen of Heaven, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our Lady of Swa the Snows, Queen of Martyrs, Queen of Peace, Queen of Heaven, Mary, Star of the Sea, Immaculate Heart of Mary. All the spirits around Mary, come out of there. semi amorous, all you spirits, move. Breathe them out, people. Let them go. Come on out of there. Hurry up. Worship and veneration of Mary. Come out. Novenas, scapular, spiritual blindness, spiritual deafness, the Feast of Peace, Feast of Life. Destruction of the family priesthood. Passion, spirits of agony and ecstasy. Ashes on Ash Wednesday. Come out now in Jesus' name. Come out now in Jesus' name. Come out of there. Come out in Jesus' name. All you religious spirits of good works, come out. Good works. Good works, come on. Spirits of good works, come out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all the black witchcraft that came into the people from the Catholic Church, I break those curses in the name of Jesus. Now come out of the people. Breathe them out, people. Let them go. Come out now. Come out now in Jesus' name. Keep moving. This is the end of this message.